uh, welcome to this New York Textile Month event um, conversation with Hrafnhildur uh, Arnadóttir, uh, shoplifter. Uh, we are going to uh, see, um, she's going to share with her as um, pictures of her show that she recently opened in Kulturhouse in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, I welcome you to New York Textile Month. It's the fifth textile month we are organizing um, on the behalf of Edel Kort in New York. Uh, Ed, New York Textile Month was initiated by Lidway Edel Kort, a very famous futurist and trend forecaster. She started this five years ago to celebrate textiles and um, just to like activate um, textile events and to collaborate with museums and schools and artists and designers and to, yeah, to be able to learn more about textiles, to celebrate textiles. And um, so this month um, we have had many events um, around all with, that have something to do with textiles. And our big event is happening at the end of the month on September 30th. It's a big conference called Archaeology and Textiles. It's a full day webinar. And as you probably all know this year, we are doing most of the events online. So because of COVID, uh, there are very few in-person events this time, uh, but we have few. And tomorrow, for example, there's an opening at Mana Contemporary in New Jersey of um, the work of an amazing group of 16 students from the MFA Textiles at Parsons. And the opening is in person from 12 to 6 p.m. Uh, and you can find more information on our website. We are also going to publish a movie with the work of the students. For those who are not in New York, uh, you can uh, follow that on our website and see the movie. But those are the future uh, designers and artists, uh, the next generation, the generation 2020. So we <clears throat> look forward to see that. And uh, there are many events. Uh, tomorrow we have Mari Mekko is going to share with us a film about one of their um, pattern makers and there's um, open studios in person and also uh, online. And uh, we have Elise Collins doing her last textile TV on Tuesday. She has been, it's the third uh, textile TV she does during textile month. So yeah, just please uh, check out the program and, and see uh, most, and many of the events are um, uploaded on YouTube, on a YouTube channel called uh, New York Textile Month. So if you missed any of the interviews or any of the talks, you can, check that out there. So I'm very happy to welcome Hrafnhildur Arnadóttir, shoplifter, an old friend of mine from Iceland. But Hrafnhildur has been based in New York for many years, probably over 20, 20 years. And the she is one of the leading Iceland and contemporary artists and represented uh, Iceland at the last Venice Biennale. And she has been, uh, she's a receiver of various grants and has been exhibiting in museums and galleries around the world. And her work is pretty amazing and probably many of you know her work. So, and last week she opened a big solo show at the Kulturhuset in Stockholm, Sweden. And we thought it would be nice to celebrate her exhibition and have her take us through the exhibition during New York Textile Month since she is a New York based artist. But she will tell us more about that um, very soon. And she is actually located in Iceland now. She, you know, that's how the world is now. We are in Iceland or New York or Sweden or wherever we need to be. And um, yeah, so I want to welcome Shoplifter. Do you want to put on your camera? Shoplifter, do you want to just... Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. I think that uh, Ragna has to uh, allow me to. Oh. <laughs> 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 Good Good oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I will. I allow you. You are officially a co-host now. Okay. And so we can see you. Hopefully. Now you can turn on your camera. And you can share your screen. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Shopnilter. <laughs> Welcome Hello. to uh, New York Textile Month event. We are so glad that you were able to take the time and that you are 
go on to show us into your exhibition. And Pleasure is all and mine. Tell us about yeah. your work and yourself. Thank you very much. So yes, um, my name is Hrafnildur Arnardóttir um, from Iceland. I've been living in New York for 25 years, so half of my life. And um, uh, there, uh, after one month in New York, I uh, met somebody at an opening and I was introducing myself. Hi, my name is Hrafnildur. And they repeated back to me, nice to meet you, shoplifter. So I uh, ended up, you know, having a little bit too much humor for myself instead of using it as it sounds like, but it just stuck. And, uh, you know, now I have the artist name Shoplifter, even though I was never going to do that. But because I work also in fashion and design, it has served me well. And um, it is um, quite impossible to use my Icelandic name in general. So there you have it. Um, here in Iceland, I am uh, not in Brooklyn, in my beloved home in New York, miss it very much. And um, so I consider myself uh, first and foremost to be an artist and uh, a little bit of an accidental uh, textile artist, really. And uh, quite a macho one at that because um, I kind of don't feel like I'm, uh, you know, I didn't have the you know, same training in, in techniques and uh, things like that, like a lot of uh, textile artists, but um, my work is fiber based uh, mainly. And um, so, you know, the, the analyzation came to me and uh, it has been uh, many years now since I started uh, working with uh, uh, human hair and synthetic hair as my main medium. Graduated from Iceland at the uh, painting department at the art school and um, just didn't work out for me that uh, it was so two-dimensional two and uh, I've always been working with uh, fabrics and textiles and stuff in my life. I worked, uh, um, well I grew up in the 70s with uh, Nordic tapestries on everybody's home walls and, um, and then I was a, you know, quite a character in the 80s as Ragnar can attest to. I was uh, breakdancer among others, you know, so the colorfulness came into action. Um, but when I moved to New York, uh, um, I decided that uh, that would be a place where I could really explore um, different aspects to uh, my character. Um, Iceland is quite uniform and um, somehow when I imagined myself um, going to a school in, uh, you know, Germany or, or Europe, you know, and I would see it in black and white when I was matching myself into a place. But uh, when I imagined myself in New York, you know, I saw it in color and I went after the color. And uh, since then, well, my art artwork in the beginning was uh, <laughs> not that colorful, but took a little bit of time. But I started uh, um, uh, my master's degree um, at the School of Visual Arts in 94 graduated in 96 and have lived in New York since. And, um, you know, as, as you are, you know, you start, you know, like um, exploring different mediums. And I realized that three dimensional and not having any limitations is the key for me, like not to limit myself to any uh, particular style. And I was like, I'm not gonna worry about, you know, this signature medium thing, you know, a black, but you know, little, do you know that um, some medium finds you and becomes your signature medium, you know? You know, th that's the beauty about, you know, working creatively that when you are like working from this sincerity and in intuition and uh, insight into, you know, your like what makes you tick and, you know, what you find beautiful or harmonious and why, you know, you want certain things to be this or that. Um, sometimes the material finds you and uh, it starts to inform your practice um, and then, you know, it uh, can snowball, you know, out of, out of control, you know, as uh, is quite the case uh, when it comes to myself and uh, my use of synthetic hair extensions nowadays. So, yeah. I love that you talk about the, that you're accidental textile artist. <laughs> did, it, did it never occur to you before you, you know, decided to become an artist that, because I know also you were, to me, you've always been a little bit of a textile, there's something yeah, textile always. about your fashion and... Yeah, 
I all I all you know like I always uh, um, looked at myself as a you know I've always been manipulating fibers and working with fabric and creating my own clothes and you know I used to do my friends' hair since we were kids and and you know um, it's just something that in the end you know became so obvious. Like many other people, you know, you know, in art school, you know, I went to painting department because maybe I'm first a colorist, then a textile artist, and uh, then a designer. I don't know, um, but I think that it was very um, obvious to me that, you know, wow, okay, yes, I am using fiber. Of course, I'm a textile artist, and. At first, when I was uh, awarded the Nordic Textile Award, I was like, oh my God, you know, what is happening here? You know, I have gray hair, I have a knot in my hair, and I'm a, you know, Icelandic textile artist from, the, you know, Scandinavia. I was like, cliche, no. And I realized that uh, I had all this uh, prejudice in myself, you know, and uh, I really tend to work against them, you know, like if I feel like I have, you know, some sort of, you know, preconceived ideas about what should be more noble than something else or something that should be more um, valid or, or high art, you know, then, then uh, I reject the prejudice and I decided to em 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 truly embrace it because I didn't agree with it because it has been, you know, um, kind of like taught it is not the you know because i'm really really inspired by um textile art in the 70s and fashion and dressing and identity and vanity and you know a lot of things that has to do with you know the human being and that's why i ended up using hair the estimate fiber that grows on our body and um yeah and i just uh, shook off you know you know like labels or not you know it's all the same you know when you do good work i think it's good work you know and i'm not talking about myself necessarily <laughs> <laughs> but you you probably like i mean you know we all learn to a lot of textile techniques in school in iceland when we are kids you know knitting, yes you it, grow up this is kind of part of our culture you know yeah. at least when we were growing up and i'm just wondering like how you know where was that like a big thing for you when you were growing up very good in knitting and crochet and those things yes i was constantly making stuff i was in my room you know tiny room with like you know you know painting silk and uh, things like that and i think that uh, and i was coming up with my own clothes because i didn't want to be like everybody else so that meant you had to make it and my mom was like you know going nuts um, because I was, uh, I never had a pattern and I was like, yeah, I just want like this and that. And I had these ideas from like magazines or I don't know where I got them from really. But, um, you know, living in Iceland, there was a scarcity. And, uh, I think that you kind of, you know, that's why people talk about Iceland, the people being so creative, because I believe it's because we're like quite bored. And we have like lack of, <laughs> lack of, uh, <laughs> lack of, you know, like uh, um, resources. Mm -hmm. So that we have to be extra inventful and, uh, or inventive, I mean. And um, so I always sometimes say that, uh, yeah, I became an artist because it was uh, um, self-medicating from boredom and then, you know, winter depression and whatnot, you know. It's a way to survive, you know, and, uh, for me, um, uh, I wouldn't survive unless I had this for a living. I did this for a living, really. No, yeah, that's a, and I like what you say about the, you know, that we need to be resourceful because I can relate to that. And I think many of us, you know, who come from Iceland and, you know, you have something in your hand and you kind of need to transform it into something else yeah. And, yeah. and you know you you learn all these techniques and even though you know i was in the painting department not the textile department at art school mm. you know my close friends were there and uh, i would uh, you know really follow up on what was going on and uh, kind of like be aware of all these techniques and uh, um but you know when it comes to myself uh, um you know i'm more of a pop artist or pop art that mm -hmm. uses uh, um, fiber or textile. Because uh, for me, it's a lot about found objects and about 
found materials that I like to take and manipulate and give them, you know, another purpose or a different uh, life or, a, you know, a different role uh, than they were made to become. Mm -hmm. So um, first I start using uh, um, human hair because I'm doing drawings, you know, of everybody blood related to me and my mother's side, 340 portraits with colorful markers and people would have like, you know, like green eyebrow. I mean, maybe that's where I got this from. But uh, that was in like, you know, 98 or something like that. And I would, you know, be drawing the hair and I realized that just, you know, every hair is just like kind of line on the paper. There is a line on the paper. And I was like, why am I not using the hair instead of drawing it if I want to communicate with that aesthetic or, or, or that vision? So I had bought the hair extension and I started manipulating it. And, and uh, that's how all this... Uh, uh, hair artwork kind of came into the picture, mm -hmm. came out of the picture. <laughs> and tell us about the, now you opened last week in Stockholm. It's not the first time you exhibit in Sweden. You had an exhibition when you got the prize, right? A few years yeah, ago. I had an exhibition at the Textile Museum in Boros. Boros, yeah. Yeah, and then I've had also, you know, exhibitions in uh, group exhibitions in Bhutan and a solo show in a gallery in Stockholm and you know like I've, I've been quite a lot in Sweden with my work maybe that's because it is um, you know the the the, the language is uh, um, closer to their heritage I don't know mm -hmm. but did you have do you have the images for the show yes let me show you about about it, the, the show what was it called? Chromo something? Chromosome. Chromosomes. Chromosomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow. do you see? Yes, this is amazing. So this opened on Friday. These are called, uh, um, this uh, exhibition is called Chromosomes. Um, it is uh, directly related to my uh, um, installation at the Venice Biennale that um, I named uh, Chromo Sapiens. Mm -hmm which is a uh, um, play, word play um, based on obviously homo sapiens. So basically um, with all these large scale installations I've been doing for many years now, I've like uh, proven that colors have a tremendous uh, um, positive effect on us and very healing, you know, powers and the texture. We all recognize the texture because we have hair, you know, most of us at least. And um, so people really identify or, you know, you are both, you know, it's, it's, it can be morbid, but, and, and it's really overwhelming, but uh, the colors are really teasing you forward and into the, the work. And so I'm trying to create this hyper nature. So in fact, I just consider myself to be an abstract landscape painter. It's just three dimensional. So what I do is that I create these dwellings Okay, let me see. What can I do to change the slide? Okay, let me just see. Maybe you need to stop sharing and share again, Ramdur. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Do you, do you see it now? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So basically the, the show consists of these two structures that you can walk into and um, be bathed in this uh, um, rainbow with these uh, hair stalagmite or stalactites, I call them, you know, because I'm trying to um, create some sort of otherworldly cavernous um, dwelling where you have this kind of meditative uh, experience you know through colors and it's like color therapy and uh the lighting um i was experimenting also with lighting here where i use these um or i created these uh lamp like um fuzzy dudes that are lighting it from the inside and then there is like different uh, color lightings on the outside you know so it is very trippy and i want to kind of like trans you know, trans, what do you call it, trans, uh, I want you to travel, you know, into some sort of another dimension 
you know, basically a, a little bit like, you know, going into your children's books or going into the artificial landscape you find digitally and um, computer games and whatnot. This, you know, like adventurous, uh, otherworldly planet that uh, I am managed to make uh, um, in analog format so that you can be the character in this world. So you are the destination really like the way you respond to the colors and the way you roam around. And I also included the soundscape in this uh, installation that um, I worked with Skule Sverison and the Swedish company called Teenage Engineering. So the soundscape uh, um, is, you know, like uh, one of the, you know, threads in the tapestry that is this work. So um, it brings breath and time and um, affects you, you know, on a different you know level of your you know another senses you know so it's like multi-sensory experience that i would like the viewer to enjoy to me all of these you know you know you see the drawings that can take take life you know here in this it's very kind of microscopic to me as well as macroscopic and I, you know, think that, you know, when you think about, you know, I did installations called uh, Nervescape and uh, those are uh, very much the mix of like escape or landscape and nerves or neurological pathways. And I think that um, the hair for me um, feels like nerve endings and uh, are very much, you know, organic shapes and textures and for me, this is uh, like an internal landscape, you know, what we have, you know, going on in, under, under our skin, but at the same time, we are not very aware of the colors and the shapes and the movement that's going on. So for me, it's like you're walking into like some, it's a body of an art and it envelops you and um, gives you a sense of, uh, you know, sense of wonder or sense of euphoria because the colors actually penetrate your retina uh, and your brain starts uh, producing oxytocin. With, and that is like uh, um, just a scientific fact that uh, it brings out the hugger in you. <laughs> so I can uh, stop sharing now and I can also show you uh, other work that um, that uh, you know are in the same my previous work. So basically, you know what is great is to see that there's people are like kind of you know they 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 walk into the exhibition, and this is uh, um, one of the views from uh, my um, exhibition Chromos Sapiens at the Venice Biennale at the Icelandic Pavilion where I had like three type of caves. One was a quite a dark one. Then it came into this uh, cathedral, multicolor matte, you know, cave with these hanging stalactites. And then um, in the white kind of more uh, heavenly, like white and fluffy cave at the end. And uh, for me, it's a journey. And I just really always wanted uh, to be able to completely surround the viewer and you know take you completely out of your reality and bring you into the painting you know without any tricks or middlemen you know so somehow taming this material has allowed me to do that somehow it's been growing and growing until I managed to um mix the colors you know I have you know tons of you know assistants of course that I you know need help from and uh, um, interns that help me create this work you know this this hair is not going to hang itself that's for sure and um, and I've developed this kind of way of uh, being able to really work in uh, um, such different uh, uh, volume and I think that next step is to uh, um, take uh, the art out of the you know, room or the museum or the gallery and, and um, I'm working on uh, developing work that can be outside in nature and weather. 
so blending um, real nature with uh, synthetic nature. And, you know, this is also, you know, a, a, a huge influence on my work uh, has been just human behavior, humans, and the way we come up with the strangest things. We invent the strangest things, you know, and it just blows my mind, you know, that there is a mass production of synthetic fiber that is meant as uh, um, hair extensions to be added to your hair. It's just like human ingenuity and just so creative and um, magnificent and whimsical and humorous and, um, and uh, ingenious, you know, it's just, you know, I love the fabulousness of vanity. You know, I think that the world would be so lame and boring if it wasn't for vanity. And uh, that's kind of where my work started, but a lot of it is in the foreground, a lot of it's in background, you know, when it comes to these layers of understanding how the hell I ended up with this work, you know. And this is uh, one of the first uh, um, times that I used color in my work. I had been using brown braids and um, I was like, I don't understand even today why I was so shy to venture into more colorful work, you know, more kind of flamboyance. And I think it's because it was so Baroque and, um, and I, you know, and I myself, I had these preconceived ideas about, you know, what can be art and what cannot be art. And uh, I started using these, uh, you know, kind of Halloween quality um, synthetic hair to do these multicolor braids. This is a, a collaboration artwork I did uh, in a window at MoMA in New York in 2008. And um, I collaborated with uh, artist collective uh, Assume Vivid Astrofocus. And um, they created these neons. And then I came in and I started like to kind of paint and draw with these uh, multicolored uh, um, uh, braided hair uh, fibers. And uh, then I would lay them and kind of, you know, like it, it's a composition, you know, I don't draw this in, a, you know, in beforehand, you know, this is the way I like to work is that I have this kind of, you know, you know, hint, a hint of what I want to do. Yeah. Sorry, there is something about the way you share the screen now because people are only see. Oh. Um, there's something about. Did you see it different? Yeah, maybe if someone can reply in the question and answer if it's better now. So it looks like. Oh, okay, maybe it's like because it's preview or something. Uh, all fine here, I can see it fine. Okay, so just, but maybe for everybody, if you minimize, you should be able to minimize Shoplifter's window, just to make her small and um, the other one is staying big. So if you click on her window and minimize where she is sitting, because some of you see it, so I think the setting is okay. So I think you should just continue. Shopee. I had to just click on Zoom yeah. again. Yeah. Okay. Royce. And should I um, um, do full screen or just leave it at this? I think you should go back to full screen. That's fine. It's not about that. It's the way okay. that people are, I think, setting the, the viewing, you know. Yeah. Okay. Let's try. You can just you can type the questions and I'm watching the questions and also later you have if you have any questions for shoplifter, please feel free to other than about the viewing of the quality of the viewing, but about her work, please feel free to add them into the Q and A section. So okay, yeah, just continue shoplifter. Yeah, so uh, this is a piece that, uh, you know, kind of started the whole colorful um, exploration. And uh, here I'm still doing slightly two dimensional, you know, painterly textile artwork, you know, um, referencing uh, Scandinavian tapestries. And, um, but to me, this is more, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing like, um, you know, kind of by, bypassing all, all, all the rules because when I was once showing this to a group of women that I had the masterclass with in Sweden, and they asked me, so how do you put it together? 
I was like, uh oh, you know, and I said, well, I do the unthinkable. And they were like, what, what? And I was like, yes, I use a glue gun and a staple gun. And the Swedish um, ladies that were there just gasped, you know, it was just, oh my God, you know, it's like I was, a, um, you know, like I was a, a fake. But it's my way of also, you know, kind of like allowing myself to bring the macho into the feminine and, you know, not be so precious about um, the process, you know, when I need to um, communicate something visually. I think that, like I said before, I, w I don't want to close any doors, you know, I don't, I tried sewing it together, it didn't look as good, you know. So the end result, you know, is uh, um, achieved. And uh, I listen to death metal, you know, Ham, <laughs> the Icelandic rock band or other like uh, intense music. And I have a pneumatic stable gun and I'm just blasting away and it's very physical work. So it may look kind of more precious and feminine and, and uh, you know, kind of cute or, you know, but uh, the act of making it is uh, not necessarily so. So, um, so here you also see, you know, that this for me is three dimensional painting in space in, 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 you know, floating drawing and painting. So here I am in Finland with uh, an installation called Nervescape. And I'm making this type of web that is, you know, um, echoing shapes we find in nature and also, um, you know, the the blood, the blood cells and the, you know, the, the veins and the neurological pathways and, and, um, and it's uh, whimsical and it's really rooted in uh, a lot of influences uh, from my past, like the Muppet Show, you know, the, um, Sesame Street, Dr. Seuss and, you know, and I, I like to um, be playful in my studio and I like to allow myself to um, just see what happens. And I later, you know, when I started doing these, I later found out, you know, okay, yeah, that's probably why I'm doing this, you know, because when I was about six years old, I used to sneak into my grandmother's uh, bedroom and open this vanity drawer, you know, she had there and she had a cut off braid from her own hair um, that been, had been cut off when she was a young woman and just, uh, it had a tremendous effect on me because it was just such an artwork because, and it also it was a, a monument to her youth, but it was also like, um, it was a separated part of her. It was just weird to me. And, and, and it almost like it had some like magical powers, you know, to show history. And um, I think that uh, that kind of like got me started probably like, being so fascinated with, you know, the fiber and the way uh, it can, hair can live off of our body and be used to create different things. You know, Icelanders uh, have made clothing out of uh, human hair and animal hair in the past, you know, because there's no outside, there's nothing else, there's no trees, there's no shop to buy yarn, you know, <laughs> and you just gotta, you know, maybe the sheeps are all gone, you know, I don't know, lost in the snowstorm. And you, you, you use what you have. So, um, yeah, so this has kind of like uh, built up, you know, to become this uh, body of work. Sorry, here's this one again. This is the Kiasma, the modern art museum of uh, Finland. And um, so I like to work into, um, I, it's site specific. So I like to, um, just kind of show up and just really kind of play with the materials in the space. I have like a vague idea about, okay, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so every time I do these installations, um, they become new, even though I always reuse everything that I have. So, because, uh, you know, as fascinated I am with the, what the human being can come up with and and the absurdity of all this mass-produced you know consumerism and uh, 
you know, how many banana cutters do we need and avocado cutters? And, you know, like, it's just, you know, beyond me. But, uh, and I like to address, you know, the absurdity of it. Um, at the same time, you know, it uh, brings me into the problem. And uh, because in order to show it, I have to have it. But so I make it a point, I make a point of uh, using every single hair <laughs> that I buy because uh, I can redo it. And uh, here I used, uh, for example, just white hair and I project, you know, a video onto it. And I, pro I, I did a um, projection that had like a wave, you know, like a fur that was kind of like moving and it was projected onto white hair and, and onto a twisted uh, metal fence. So again, you know, like kind of mixing together, you know, masculine, cold steel, that is actually like woven, you know, with uh, um, the hair fibers. And uh, yeah, and, and you know, I just like experimenting um, as long as I find new ways of, uh, or excited to do more stuff in this direction, um, I do. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm also doing a lot, you know, a lot of like smaller work when I'm in my studio. I like to like uh, needlepoint my little mask here for, <laughs> I did this in uh, um, when I was in quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> but uh, um, I just like to transform a space and create um, multisensory, um, uh, you know, experiences for the viewer. And um, sorry, this one here is in an old chapel in Como in Italy. And uh, here I decided, for example, to use more white and pink and, uh, you know, kind of um, angelic, uh, you know, fluffy colors, cotton candy, you know, so it is almost like it's ghosts or angels in a way inside this old uh, dilapidated uh, chapel. And uh, these I call fathoms, um, these hanging kind of stalagmite uh, structures that are uh, blended uh, hair extensions um, that you can, and fathom uh, is a measurement from like, that sailors would use to measure the depth of water from like one, you know, a hand to another one by like, you know, stretching a um, rope like that. And it's also in Iceland, the same name is also to Hög or, or Fadama. So, and that's also from like, you know, one, one glove to another, one uh, hand to another. So, um, you know, things like this, you know, like, you know, informs the work, but uh, it is an additional information of my um, inspiration. This year uh, is one of my uh, earlier work from 2008 as well, and uh, I call it Vanity Disorder. And here I'm using uh, human hair extensions that have already been colored. And that's another thing, you know, people ask me like, so you color it all yourself, but I don't because uh, um, I like to find, be limited by what I find, you know, I, I like to be informed by the material that is already out there and take it and transform it and manipulate it to become something else than it was intended to be. And um, I've often like, you know, um, said that I'm fighting for vanity to be considered the positive force of nature because it has, it has really bad rap and uh, I, I don't really agree with that really. <laughs> I think that it's uh, pretty amazing. And here you see I'm referencing um, it's like dripping paint, graffiti, um, geometrical um, drawing or painting. So I'm referencing art history from the um, abstract expressionists to um, graffiti uh, artists. And I think that uh, when I started making this work, it became very clear that the tapestry of the different cultures in New York was finally starting to, um, you know, come into my work because the reason I went to New York was to be exposed to more variety of 
cultures and people and uh, just have a more international sense of uh, being and uh, be less isolated and uh, celebrate different, you know, creative uh, force in, you know, with hu humanity. And um, so I think that, uh, yeah, that uh, here you can see, for example, you know, the inspiration of uh, um, cornrows and black culture, but also uh, in Iceland, we used to, uh, old women used to braid their um, hair into these like infinity sign, you know, in the back of their head, you know, with uh, the, when they would put on the national costume. These are planets, uh, I call them, uh, this is a comet, for example, multicolor, um, uh, you know, this uh, burst of color. And, and here I'm like plucking the hair with a tiny little um, crochet needle through a mesh. And um, it is a kind of a mixture of uh, the technique of uh, tatting or, or ria, I think it's called, uh, tatting in English and felting but it's neither and both at the same time so it's my own technique shopified and um and i like you know the fact that uh, the work starts to look you know very like like i said microscopic and macroscopic and these are kind of planets and you know here you have a cosmic cell it's like a blood cell to me and this is nothing and um and then I started realizing that I can uh, uh, manipulate uh, the colors even more uh, with this technique and uh, started creating these uh, um, emojis, these smileys that have now um, become quite some characters. And every time, you know, I do them, I, I um, draw it again and again, you know, so it's not like a, just one format, you know, hippie planet you know i mean i like coming up i like naming the work also you know because it uh, really kind of brings about the different kind of aura into the mix so the round shape has become a very you know inspiring format for me and this before i was doing this more kind of square kind of painterly um artwork you know after doing the moma window and this one is called at sea after i started doing it i realized that the blue was like starting to look like sea and uh, so this is uh, you know beach sea you know landscape and um you don't have to see the same things that i see you know but uh, um it is uh, it's abstract painting expressionism babes <laughs> You see like the difference, you know, it's the same hair, but here I've mixed the colors like in a completely different manner to create this really intricate uh, colors. And uh, these are all found uh, colors that uh, I cut down and I create, you know, this mix. And then I pluck that through the netting. It's, yeah, not everything is done with a um, stable gun and a glue gun, but, uh, more precious uh, so like you know it's really whatever like helps me you know create the language um is what i do and this one is uh one of the first artwork that i did you know inspired by my grandmother's braid and uh, um my own uh, uh braid that i still have after cutting my hair to have the same braid as my grandmother but the shock and uh, the broken you know, sense of identity that I had after I cut my hair was shocking and traumatic. So yeah, I mean, I guess it's all Freudian in the end. Here's the close-up. So yeah, this is the start of this all being entangled in the uh, textile art. Here I was like, you know, before I could, you know, like kind of had figured out this is more like a drawing and I would like just hang it in, on site um, with small nails. And this is like probably um, 
God, you know, I'm so metric, but uh, let me try. This is probably like uh, eight feet by six or something. Here's a sculpture I call a white wedding. Uh, it's a, a life-size horse sculpture. I wanted to create this giant uh, uh, Baroque creamy wedding cake of a horse. Um, this uh, like, you know, the, the, the horse girl uh, type of reference and um, almost like a porcelain statue gone life-size and for real, you can sit on it. And here, you know, like, I don't know how much I, you know, I just have the, I mean, I have endless images, you know, to show you, but this is one of, uh, from a series called Imaginary Friends, and it's called Glenn Blusher. And this, here I use, for example, designer, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Pantyhose. Yeah, pantyhose. It's an uh, Icelandic company called Kronkron, and I make uh, pantyhose, and, and, you know, like, I use whatever grabs my attention, and, um, and it's, you know, and then I put hair inside and then I plug it through. There is part of it is human hair, part of it is a synthetic hair. There's also some like uh, lights in these uh, tree hanging uh, things there. Sleeping Beauty. So yeah, like uh, when I'm in my studio, I have already accumulated, you know, curiosities. And uh, when I'm working, I don't have to go and buy what I need because what I find, you know, becomes the work, you know, what I have, I, I get things that uh, inspire me because of color or shape or form or texture. And um, so it is a big, you know, um, collection of uh, um, found objects and uh, inspirations that I can then um, draw on when I'm in my studio and uh, put together into like compositions. Um, this is an imaginary friend called Bompa. It's a um, monument to PMS. Very feminist. This is my sister and her sock. Um, my sister, I was missing her. She kept um, forgetting one of her socks in my house every time she went to Iceland. So I was missing her and I created this one for her. Little Tater, what is that? It's like little asshole or little something. <laughs> um, I like making these characters and I think I'm quite cartoony, as you can see. These are two glass eyes on the sock with uh, um, hair plucked through. And um, um, I think that uh, it also took me a long time to bring like uh, humor into my work along with the color. And um, through these imaginary friends, uh, sculptures that stand, you know, um, okay, performances, whatever. Um, so yeah, so I, I was able to um, use more of these found objects and do these compositions and th that uh, built into these uh, characters. So how are we on time? Like, are we? Uh, um... Yeah, this is so interesting. I, mean, <laughs> I could this, talk for I, I could listen to you, you know, the whole <laughs> day. And I know you have like, you, we could do this three times, you know, three <laughs> for the time. but we have some questions. Oh, great. And uh, one of them, please, if you know, you have, if anybody else has questions to ask uh, shoplifter, type them in the we have about 10 minutes, but uh, Rebecca Machi Tuck asks, uh, she says that your sculptures are so light and ethereal. I'm curious as to how you plan for them to hang up in your installations. Do you draw out the plan beforehand or do you just begin a large form or organically and plan from for the display afterwards? Did you get it? Yes, basically what I do is that, you know, um, because it's kind of hard to, you know, I have like this uh, vision of what I want to see in the space and um, it's very hard to, to, to draw beforehand. Um, I have like a skeleton of an idea, but the real work uh, takes place in the process of hanging it. And I don't want to know too much in advance because also the hair is uh, 
wild and it's hard to tame it and I could draw it to death and it wouldn't behave the same when I got into the space. So what I do is that I um, try to communicate as much as I can to the people that are offering me to exhibit so they don't freak out. And then I just wait until I get there <laughs> to show them what the heck I was talking about and with a lot of help. And uh, I travel with a fixed team, you know, because they have, uh, you know, learned so much about um, the way I work and what I want to be the re end result. And they trust, you know, in what I'm talking about. They understand, you know, my uh, uh, use of uh, phrases and words, you know, when I'm talking about what I want, you know, like, and um, so, um, in the beginning, I was doing it all myself, you know, and uh, and that's like insane, you know. So I decided that, yeah, I can have somebody else braid for me or create the bundle of hair. Um, because my uh, uh, father gave me a good advice, uh, you know, that uh, you should you know, make sure that uh, um, you find people to do the things that they can do just as well as you can so that you can have the time to do the things that only you can do. And I think that's a... Very good. You, you can abuse it, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good um, advice. I don't know, did I answer the question? See, I'm such a Yes, you did. And uh, I'm also curious to know, because I know you were in Stockholm for like two weeks before the opening. Is that the time that you need to set up an installation like yeah. you have now? Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the floor is uh, um, just, just the size of the space, you know, um, the floor plan, you know, is... Uh, 500 square meters, that's like, uh, um, what, like 5,000, like 8,000 square feet? No, six, uh, see, yeah. 25 years later, and I can't calculate this thing. Um, it's big. And um, in order to, I mean, it's a composition in space, so I can kind of like uh, calculate more or less, you know, what I'll need in order to do it and all, all the, you know, um, one of uh, my, um, uh, one of my guys, you know, he came from Finland and he started working on the structure with the local guy. Then a week later, you know, my assistant from New York came and started like preparing the materials that have been shipped from China with a five people, um, uh, textile students from the Konstfak uh, Academy in Stockholm like handpicked because of their extreme um, talents, you know, and uh, very lucky. And, um, and then, you know, I arrived two weeks before. So it is three weeks or so that um, is needed, you know, the, you know, they're painting, the, like the people in the museum already painted the walls and we laid the carpet also. So um, two weeks is like least time you need, you know, and the more people you have, the less time you need, obviously. But then again, you know, it's not enough. It's a lot of work also to communicate what needs to be done. And that's why it's just great that I have two um, uh, studio uh, managers and a creative producer so that uh, all of this can happen, you know, you know, without me going, you know, insane. <laughs> <laughs> And I was also thinking about the, you know, collaboration with the musicians, because you do that most of the time when you do such a large scale installations, you are collaborating yeah, with musicians and now with School is Sverison, right? And with Ham. Yeah, and he produced, you know, the uh, soundscape in Venice uh, that was created by um, this uh, death metal band, uh, Kölsch band, Ham. And um, for me, the soundscape... Uh, plays a role of uh, being one of the element of the art work. You know, when I talk about tapestry, it's just kind of interwoven with the work. It's not like something that you're listening to, like a, like a um, record, you know. It is uh, um, created in a way to be, be this organic uh, feed of uh, um, musical uh, information. And uh, he created something that's almost like uh, this very meditative, um, snippets of sounds that uh, we together selected and then teenage engineering uh, created the programming that um, fed these sounds into multi-channel um, 
systems that uh, went to hidden speakers inside the artwork so that you walk around and you are let you're led with the sound you know so you never hear the same same sound and it takes about two lifetimes for you to come back to the same mm -hmm. sound so it is a, an organic kind of um uh yeah I, I want to use sound you know, not as a backdrop and just to support and prop up the work it needs to be have a reason um and, and a good reason you know and i think that with the installations you know they are environments and the uh, environments seldom come silent and i think that um it kind of has the sensibility of growth and I, like i said uh, it brings breath and time to your you, you know your presence in the work and uh it it helps you kind of like slow down or move or you know there's like a sound you hear here suddenly and then you hear it there also so you're like you know so it's it's disorienting but not uh, in a negative way it is um you kind of start to like experience yourself your own senses uh in a in a more kind of like a crisp way i think you know because you're also like the outside world is uh, um kind of is left at the door mm -hmm. interesting and i know you are in iceland you left new york because of the pandemic in march and do you know how long you're staying well like, i decided to stay here until uh, new year's at least because uh, um, my daughter is going to school here now because uh, i didn't want to find out you know either way you know i came here in march and uh, i always like to spend summers here and uh, then I decided that, okay, I'm going to wait until the election and just stay here. But um, I miss New York tremendously. It is such a source of inspiration for me. The energy, um, the colorfulness, and just the tremor of creativity, the tremor, the human tremor of uh, emotion and electricity. And... Um, and I'm not ready to give that up for anybody, whoever is sitting in the White House, really. You know, I think that, you know, if you're lucky enough to fall in love with New York, I think it's for life. And, you know, that's where I see myself going back to. Oh, no, that's a nice ending, Shoplifter, <laughs> to our, your presentation, you. you know. And thank you so much. And uh, thank you guys for listening. We have a, a great to website, shoplifter.us, right? That's the website. Yes, yes. Yeah. So and uh, know. Instagram shop if there are. Yeah, check it out and yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. upload this video on YouTube and see if the image was small or large. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't view. But and thank you everybody for attending and shop litter. Thank you so much. I would love you, to see guys. the big installation live. I don't know if I will be able to make it to Stockholm, but this was amazing to get to see it from here. And um, thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.